Great. So um, if you haven't come across CMX Connect before, I'm going to go do a bit of a talk through what it's all about. So the main aim of CMX is to encourage people who um, are in any way involved with communities to come together and learn. And we're doing this virtually, obviously, because of the current COVID situation. So virtual connects are really different in that we can't necessarily see you faffing about with your phone or checking your emails. So this is my encouragement to you to say, switch off your phone, put it somewhere out of reach, close down all the tabs that you've got open and just let yourself focus on this session and give yourself this time to actually engage with the talk. Because uh, there's so many distractions that can come up nowadays when you're on your computer. Um, yeah, make this time for yourself and let yourself really engage. And we also can't see you snacking, so feel free to have a nosh on something or have a drink whilst you're, um, whilst you're watching. So CMX Connect um, is organized by uh, CMX. It's powered by a tool called Bevy, which is software that you can use to build communities in person and now virtually all over the world. And there are CMX, chat, CMX Connect chapters in 60 plus locations. So if you're joining us today and you're not from Ipswich, which I think is probably the majority of people here, there may well be a CMX chapter nearer to you that you could get involved in. And if there isn't, you can always set one up. Um, and that's what I decided to do back at the beginning in the spring to set up a group in Ipswich. I've been going to the group in London for about a year. Uh, so going down to London once a month to join that group because I knew I wanted to work in community management and I wanted to do professional development. I wanted to get to know other people and learn what I didn't know, basically. So yeah, I can't, I can't recommend it highly enough. I've had a great time organizing meetups. And this meetup actually is organized between myself and Tiff, um, who we, we both live in the Ipswich area. So we got to know each other through random LinkedIn messages when I was messaging anyone who had community in their hmm. job titles. Um, and it's like, you live like just down the road from me and you do community. <laughs> Let's do this. I have to give Ruth all the credit, though. I'm kind of a bit more of a bystander. She's the, she's the bigger organiser out of the pair of us. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the goals of CMX Connect meetups like this is to connect with at least one other awesome person, which I'm sure we will all manage to do in this meetup tonight, to learn one actionable thing from this session that you can take away and implement. And it's really cool if you tweet that out later using the CMX Connect and mention CMX Ipswich, because it also helps others to learn from what you've learned. Um, so there may be some gem of wisdom. You think, oh, well, that's awesome. I'm going to take that away and implement that. And also, finally, to advocate and grow the community industry, because the community industry is really growing. But there isn't necessarily that focus on peer-to-peer uh, -peer connections and networking and professional development. And that's the area where we can really make a difference and help us all raise our game and learn from each other. Um, I mentioned that it's powered by Bevy. So Bevy is the tool that we use to manage all of these meetups. So it's what you use to book on. It's what we use to do the virtual meetup, this tool that we're using right now. Um, so you can contact them if you're interested. It's, this is the kind of corporate slide for the event. So today I'm really excited to have a guest speaker. PJ is going to be talking about community the importance and value of being a member. So PJ is founder and chief community officer of Devrelate.io and a few other exciting things, which I'm sure he will uh, talk about. So I'm going to hand it straight over to you, PJ, and then we'll all be quiet and you can tell us all your gems of wisdom. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tiffany, Ruth, for having me. You're, you're both amazing people. Uh, and I think it's awesome that what you're doing for the community. Okay, so... Let's see if Chrome's going to let me share my screen. Apparently not. Okay. Hold on. Uh, so, you know, one of the most important things about community is sharing. Uh, and the most important thing about sharing is making sure you, sh you share, share securely. So let me just make sure that Google Chrome is allowed to share things. <laughs> okay. And now... Should be okay. Da, 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 drum roll. <laughs> Let's see. Do, 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 share. Can you see my screen? I can see Mattermost. Yes. Excellent. 
So now can you see an awesome, well, okay. When you're ready. Uh, now can you yes. see a slide with the title on it? Yes. Hooray. Okay. You're doing awesome. Well done. So the importance and value of being a, a, a member. So my name is PJ. Uh, I'm at Esplinic on Twitter, which is a wonderful story that I'm sure we'd all love to hear. Uh, but let me tell you a little bit about me because we're not here to talk about my spleen. So I'm a developer and community advocate. I currently work for a company called Mattermost. I also find it, founded a company called Deverlate. I've been involved in community work for over 10 years now. Um, uh, I just really like to get involved with people. Uh, this year has been tough because it's been all virtual, but you know we managed to, 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 to find ways to communicate. Uh, the company I work for Mattermost, they, they pay me, so I have to say these things. Mattermost is a communication platform that allows for a bunch of different collaboration techniques to be used online or behind a firewall. It's kind of like Slack or Discord, but it's open source, which means you can add what features you want and build anything that isn't readily available. And so I do a lot of different things as far as like, you know, working with communities. I speak at events like this. Um, I speak at the big conferences. I speak at the little conferences. Um, I do a lot of podcasting. I write a lot of content and I participate in a lot of meetups, not as a speaker, but just as a member. And that's kind of what I'm here to talk to you about today. So let me lay out the goals a little bit. In this talk, we're going to focus on communities, how they work for you and how you work for them. Um, I find it val valuable to always establish a few goals and the definition first. So I have a feeling some of this might be a review for a few of the people here, but it's always nice to have a refresher. And for those of you new to building and working with communities, this will give you a good foundation to move forward. Um, we'll, first, we'll start by defining what community means in the modern context uh, for both business and personal exploration. We'll take a look at what memberships mean um, and managing kind of the expectations of being a member. Uh, we'll extend that through an examination of being a participant as opposed to just signing up or showing up. Um, where we where we where do we find our value in our value in communities? Uh, we'll cap it all off with some tips on avoiding toxicity. All this will serve as a great discussion on communities and how we see our roles within them, and how we can how they can be of benefit to us as individuals and the organizations we work for, but also how we can get the most from our community participation. So first, let's take a look at exactly what community is and why it's important to the things that we do. Let's give it a definition. Um, and I always like, I like, this is always, okay, so here's a little trick on speaking. This is a little extra bonus thing. I always like to give a definition. I always give the literal dictionary definition first, and then I'm going to tell you that it's wrong. Um, so defining a community may sound easy, but as we see with the dictionary definition, this kind of misses the mark of what we're talking about. Well, this is great from like an urban planning perspective or someone who's trying to build an office space. It doesn't really fit what we're focusing on here. For the broadest definition of, de of community, we need to think in terms of more modern scale. Starting at the widest angle, let's say a community is a group of individuals drawn together to discuss, study, research, or learn about a particular area of interest common to all the members of the community. Um, this definition includes some of what those dictionary definitions give, but also kind of eschews the need to focus on physical location or any sort of organizational authority. I mean, if, if you look at this meetup, like none of us are in the same place. Very few of us are even geographically close to each other, except for I think Tiff and Ruth. But, and, and this is, I mean, it's good that we have this more open definition because um, as we look for towards more modern technology, we see how like it's changed what a community is and what a community can mean. You'll note that in the working definition that we have for community right now, we have avoided the phrase like-minded when it comes to the individuals that make up a community. It's better to think of a community as working toward a common goal. Um, the different ideas and approaches to achieving that goal foster an important diversity of thought without which our community would be less of a method of sharing and obtaining knowledge or celebrating something specific, but more of a cult where the freedom of thought necessary for growth is stifled in favor of being in lockstep with commandments or other concepts. Uh, you might think, of, you know, those are some words that kind of get mixed up, but it's very important to remember that the, the idea of communities to push things forward, communities are supposed to grow. Uh, we want them to grow and evolve. If that means that we can only work towards one thing and there's some sort of done or finished aim or something so specific that it only works for a part of the group, then we're not really working with a community. Um, some members you know, of, of a community are likely to leave. Maybe some return, some might not. And new members are always likely to participate even though they didn't initially. So you're going to have your founders. You're going to have your longtime members. You're going to have your members that filter in and out. You're going to have your members that are brand new and just showed up for the first time. That's going to happen pretty often. Communities are organic. We have to think of them as that. And they're ever-changing, almost like an amoeba or a butterfly. But unlike a butterfly, 
they keep changing into more and more things. And that's kind of the value of finding, you know, that common goal. So we also need to encompass some of the new technological concept when it comes to seeing the modern sense of community. No longer is this simply an issue of geography or location. Um, it's probably where you started. You probably started a local meetup or you started at work um, or you started in some place where you're physically located with the people who are, who are working towards the same goal, the people who created up that com com community, excuse me. And I don't mean to be that person, but the whole idea of geography and location not being important isn't really a new phenomenon. Um, it may even surprise some people to think that online communities didn't even begin with the likes of Facebook or Twitter or anything like that, though they definitely popularized things. Um, ironically, there's actually a tweet going around asking people, you know, they, they talked about how the internet really became a thing in 1993. And if that's where people started, and I, I in a very jocular and yet somewhat arrogant, I'm not going to lie, way said, no, actually I was on before that. We were using BBS systems to dial into telnet numbers to post messages to each other long before that. Um, as far back as the early 80s, online communities began when home computer and video game enthusiasts began exploring concept called bulletin boards, BBS. Um, if you remember back to your university days, there was always like that court board or like the announcement about clubs or band shows or people buying and selling items or so-and-so has this book to sell. Do you want it? Um, this was the same concept, except a person would dial into a server one person at a time. So can you imagine if Facebook worked this way where you could only dial in one person at a time? Maybe it'd be a better place. Um, you would peruse the messages, maybe leave some messages, discuss topics, play some games. Um, the geography and location didn't actually matter. Even at that point, all you needed was a computer and a telephone line and a telephone number to call. Um, but you put all this together and we get even further away from the idea of geography and location when it comes to community. Between our growing technology and our ability to reach people around the world, the use of online tools, we truly can have a global community. And I'm not just saying that in like the super silliest sense of like, you know, oh my God, the global community. But like literally people around the globe, like there's people from different parts of the world in this meeting right now. And it's a meetup in Ipswich. I'm from Buffalo, New York. That's not even a big place. Like, you know, it's amazing that we actually have this opportunity. Um, but all this is just to define what a community is. The focus of this talk is to actually discuss where the value comes in. And for that, we need to look at why communities are important, both for the work we do, but also for our own personal interests. Um, why is being part of a community important? But even more so, why is being a participant key to getting value from the communities we're in? So let's talk a little bit about why community matters. I have a feeling this group really already knows this, but we're going to go over a few examples here. So if I were to decide, and when I came up with this idea, I didn't really know where I was going with it, but we're, bear with me. It's kind of kooky. If I were to decide I needed to know more about how windmills work, I'm not a windmill expert. I'm not going to go to school to learn to build windmills. I'm just an enthusiast. I could begin with my own study. And I mean, let's let's all be honest with each other here. The first thing I do is read the Wikipedia article on windmills to see if I was actually interested in it. If I could get through the entire Wikipedia article on windmills, it means that I am at least more than cursory interested in windmills. Next side, maybe I'd pick up a book or two. Windmills for dummy, dummies. Getting started with windmills. How to build, build a windmill in your yard without your neighbor or your spouse murdering you, you absolute nut job. You know, the books that everybody gets, the basic starter books. We all know what I'm talking about. Um, but as any enthusiast will tell you, these are only great beginnings without anyone to support or challenge my notions of what windmills are, their functions, why it's a bad idea to build one in my yard. I'll never really glow, grow as a windmiller, which is I'm 98% sure exactly what windmill enthusiasts are called. Uh, I did zero research on that one, but you know, you can feel free to challenge me on whether windmillers are called windmillers or not, but to grow and learn. I need to find others who share my interests. I need to know more about the windmilling community. Entering a community is kind of like entering into a conversation. Up to this point, I've been talking to myself, maybe in my own head, about windmills. And we may not even be sure that we have the shared interests others are professing, or if this is a passing thing. What if windmilling is just a phase? What if this is just something that's going to work for now, but I'm not really that cool with windmills. And then I have this thing in my yard and I'm like, what do I do with this? Finding other folks with varying levels of effort invested into the idea and varying levels of interest to help solidify or desolidify the concepts that I have around this particular area of focus is super important. 
This might actually seem negative, but finding out that you aren't interested in a topic or that you don't find value in it as part of your initial assumption led you to believe it's, it's actually kind of freeing. It actually feels good. And this is true even if you're doing community management with an organization. It could be that you're thinking, oh, we really need to work with X community because X community is where our people are. And then you go and you find out that, hey, X community isn't really into what you're doing. And also X community is only kind of tangentially related to the product that you produce. Well, it's good that you did the exploration to find out. But to find that value, it requires other people. If you just look at a thing and say, we're going to do this thing, we're going to work with this community, and you start, I don't know, sponsoring things or, you know, getting involved and you find out it's not really too true, you're not really involved. I mean, there's no value there. And in order to find out the value, you really need some sort of reflection, some sort of sounding board. You need other people. And I know this seems counterintuitive, but sociologists have asserted this for so many years, that humans derive the value of their activities from the value assigned by the people around them which is an interesting concept, especially with the individualistic behavior that we generally exude. The idea of that working together moves the needle with us as human beings is kind of the point of this. It's overquoted, often said that humans are social animals. Um, we cannot survive in a social vacuum. If we want to learn and grow, we'll need to find people looking to learn and grow with us. It's important to note we're still posing this discussion in the most utopian terms. Simply showing up at a meetup for windmillers in no way means everyone will accept, be accepting or inclusive of my ideas or that they even don't think that I'm some kind of crazy person or even that meetups about windmillers exist, which I'm pretty sure they don't. Um, don't quote me on that though. Windmilling community, I'm really sorry you were the example. Uh, this is something that we need to build into our communities. And, and later I'll use some examples on how that's done in the tech world because um, that's where I come from. I come from tech specifically open source, but we'll get into that. Finding com a compassionate, open community with a shared interest will, without a doubt, foster growth. And it will see that, we, you know, it will help us define what we're looking for in our activities, whether they be our personal activities or our corporate activities. Uh, maybe we build a community windmill instead of trying to build the thing in my yard. Everyone benefits through the activity of a community. Everyone comes together to work towards a common goal. And that common goal is generally sharing and finding things that we build. So let's talk a little bit about what membership is. It seems like an easy concept, but it's not always the easiest to grasp. The first step is out of the way. We have joined. We are in Windmillers 101, uh, the local windmill meetup. Uh, but this is just the beginning. We need to understand what it is to be a member. Some In some communities, you're accepted as a member simply by the virtue of showing up. Um, we think about like churches or religions, especially in your early years. You're a member mostly because your family members are members or practice that faith. You are by default a member as soon as you're born, even though there might be some acts to get you th more thoroughly involved. When you're born, you are a member of that religion. Not only is the act of membership not your choice, you're a member by default. Your level of participation is minimal. I mean, you're a baby. What are you going to do? Um, if at all, for the first few years. Later, you have more control over your commitment as a member of that community, and you choose to be a part of it, but you're kind of initiated at things. Other things, like being a student when you're young, show a sense of you joining and now participating actively, though you still haven't made a conscious choice to join. Here, unlike at church, you get a bit more control over how you participate, though it may not be obvious at first. Also, this is generally the time where you form the first community you do join of your own volition. So building a friend group, and I, I hope everybody is looking at the fact that I had to stick windmill somewhere in this because, you know, there's the whole windmill thing going on. Uh, building a friend group is the start of building your first community. Often this is the longest lasting community you'll be a member of outside your immediate family, which is, again, not voluntary and arguably not necessarily permanent. Um, families can move on and, and you won't always be friends with your friends forever. Uh, your friend group is something that starts around the common factor of age initially. Generally, in the single digit, so in the single digit age group, you're friends with other children at school. That's where you see them. That's where you interact with them. Gender, politics, romance, none of these things matter at this point. Believe it or not, there have been so many studies done that it's not a matter of boys play with boys and girls play with girls. That's just not true. Um, but you all have one common interest, which is doing things that make you happy, whether that be painting or playing with blocks or running around the yard kicking a ball doesn't matter there's something that makes you happy and that's where your friends are found um it'd be great if that's how everything stayed for the rest of your life but as we all grow things start to change and your interests start to shift with it so as our interests change so does our community and our memberships within those communities 
We remain close to some people, generally those who we continue to share a common bond with or have shared activities like playing music or enjoying a sport. Sometimes these common interests lead to becoming members of other communities and growing the social ties as bonds of common in interest deepen. Um, these are all, for lack of a better term, simple community memberships. Uh, some of them overlap as well. It could be that, you know, you have a school friend that you've known forever that, that has a certain religious belief. So that religious thing was kind of their default community. Um, but they invite you as their social friend to, you know, their social community to be a part of what they're doing. And, and there's, so there's, it's not, nothing's quite as clear cut. It's not going to be siloed off the way it is. A lot of times there's much overlap in, in the things that we do as, as simple communities. As we leave our school days, and sometimes we leave our school friends behind, we start to seek out larger communities, often in a professional capacity or as part of our careers. For me, this meant moving from the communities I, I was in, which was uh, basically I was, I was a musician for a long time. Um, I did computer programming on the side. Uh, and I started to look at things that made me have that same feeling when I moved into the, the coding officially, like being a coder and working in the DevOps section and building applications and things like that. Uh, I, so I started looking at meetups. And for some folks here, it might be about finding groups that focus on marketing or messaging to larger communities or community management. But chances are there's something in your professional capacity that got you interested in doing this professionally. And finding a community that also supports that will help bring out new ideas and perspectives. The key point here is that membership becomes less of a default, and becomes more something you need to seek out actively. The expectation that simply because you perform a certain job, like building marketing campaigns or writing code, makes you a member of communities is fraught with inaccuracy. A major factor of this is the sheer number of communities associated with any of our given activities. Everything from a local meetup to a large scale chat server with a majority of the people in a given industry means these are communities within communities within communities. It's not easy to claim membership and the effort continually increases to make to be a part of it. And then there's what level of membership one works towards. So let's take a little bit of a look at participation versus signing up. Um, I think we both know what those terms mean. Uh, or we know what both of those terms mean. I don't know why both of us, there's many people here. Um, membership's important, but it comes at different levels. Determining what level you or your organization want to engage in when it comes to community involvement is critical to how perceptions will be managed within the organization within the community. First, we'll take a look at signing up. And, and Ruth and I were talking a little bit about this before we got started. Uh, for this example, I'm going to take some anecdotes from my work in a technical field. But uh, no need to worry. I'm not going to go like too far into the tech rabbit hole. Um, the field I often focus on is called open source. The idea is that something can be built, an application, a programming language. Anyone can use it for free. That's the simple definition. It's a little more complicated than that, but it'll it'll get us to where we're going right now. It may be that they can use part of parts of it for free or use it to build other things without incurring cost. And it varies from project to project and community to community. There are positive and negatives to these communities and the things they develop. But the idea here is that we start with the understanding this is a global Widespread, widespread community that has existed for over 30 years. Many of the organizations I've worked for, including all my current work, are focused on open source, though how they interact both past and present vary greatly. Now, taking advantage of open source is super easy. There isn't even a need to sign up. As a matter of fact, we're all doing it right now. The internet is built on the concept of open source. Open source software built it, open source software maintains it, open source software keeps it moving forward, which is amazing. And this is actually the same for, you know, for the more direct open source community. First, let's look at an example of being a wallflower. A company is looking to make a new kind of internet application. Let's say it's like Facebook, but for dogs. We'll call it Dogbook. You know, you may know this, you may not know this, but everything that Facebook is built on is open source. Um, they are required to pay exactly $0 for the software that they build. Um, Dogbook, unlike Facebook, doesn't have billions of dollars from investors and they don't have an easy way to get going. So they use open source. They grab some languages to build their application in and a database. And they in no way give back to the communities that continue to move those languages forward. They don't have time. They're under no obligation to do so either. Whoops. Um, but they still consider themselves part of that community. Um, we would consider them to be passive members. They've signed up, but they only take. They rarely participate or give back. It's kind of sad in a way. But a lot of times, especially with companies, in the beginning, that's the way it is. You don't have the time or the resources to give back. So you've just signed up. You're not a participant. You're not a member. Some of the folks at Dogbook, they aren't really cool with this. They're a little uncomfortable about it. 
They feel the company should be a better community, better community citizens. They decide to start attending a local meetup around one of the languages the dog book team has been using. Uh, they want to watch talks and maybe even up their skills a little bit, improve it. So just one team decides to go to the local meetup. This is taking an active membership in the community. We aren't yet contributing, but we are taking steps to express interest in the community and to learn and work with towards the common goal of the community. It's likely we're still taking from the community. Uh, meetups are often places where people go to meet folks from other organizations and whether on purpose or accidentally, they might find jobs. It happens. Um, often no one does it intentionally. Uh, it's happened to me a couple of times. Um, so for the most part, Dogbook still really isn't giving back. Again, there's no obligation to do so. No one thinks they're evil or taking advantage of the situation. It's just what it is. They are participants in the community. Whether they're considered members is kind of in the eyes of the people who are there. So these Dogbook employees, right? They've been going to the meetups for a few months. They've been sharing new and interesting information with their team when they come back to work the next day. They're generally enjoying it. And dog book, as it turns out, is something people really want. So they're doing okay financially. The company's growing. Excuse me. These folks who have been exploring the open source communities, they want to give back. It's decided they will, in their own time, contribute code and documentation to some of the open source languages and tools they've been using. So here we start to see some true active membership. The exchange of ideas has become. Up to this point, communication and consumption has been in a single direction. The dog book folks would go, they would just take it in, but they weren't really giving back. They weren't giving talks. They weren't, you know, saying anything. They'd go to the meetup, take their notes, maybe chat with a few people and then go back and bring the ideas to the company. They weren't really participating. They were just kind of there. So now they're really in the game. They're giving back to the community. For some communities, until the giving back starts, you aren't looked upon as a member. Um, this isn't about initiation or granting office or having some sort of, you know, important stated role. This is about free, freely flowing exchanges. An exchange, by its very nature, cannot be one way or it is without value to all parties involved. So finally, the dog book C-level folks, the founders, the, the directors, the CEOs and CCOs and the CTOs and everybody who has a C in their name, they start to see what's going on. They're realizing it's time to take to step up to the plate. And I'm sorry, that's a super American phrase. Uh, but they decide it's time to take action. They begin finding ways to finance the open source languages they've leveraged to launch this successful social media platform for dogs. Donations, giving paid time to team members working on those open source projects that they were doing in their own time, sponsoring meetups and conferences, sending pizza and drinks to the meetups whenever they can. Swag, we all love swag. Now, Beyond the act of participating, the teams at Dogbook have become citizens of the communities they wanted to be a part of. They've become true members. They can find the value of what they do in the communities they're a part of, and the communities appreciate their membership. This is true not only because of the financial benefits to the community, that's actually a two-way street, but because the tr more true participants the a community gathers, the more value it gives to all of its members. So the more membership, the more you are involved and invested in your membership, the more value the community you're participating in actually has for you. In return, Dogbook gets a more stable set of, stool, of tools, wow, dog stools, a more stable set of tools to deliver their product to their Dogbook community. Everyone wins. This isn't just a, a made up example using a company. I used to work at a company called Engine Yard. Uh, we had an office here in Buffalo, even though our main office was in San Francisco. And our main office in Buffalo actually hosted a bunch of meetups. We thought it was great because it was our opportunity to give back our space, give back our time. Um, we had a fridge with drinks. We had food for everyone. We had a great projector and setup. And, and I'll get a little bit into more of that. But it's a great way, an easy way to be involved in the community. Now it's even easier. So let's talk a little bit about giving back. In the example we looked at to explain levels of membership, we also focused heavily on the aspect of giving back. And that took many different forms. The first was giving back with time. Um, when we find int an interest, a cause, some community we hope to be a part of or participate in, time becomes a, the very first entry point. Time can look different for the individual in, con in contrast to the organization. For example, I'm giving up my time to be here and give this talk. And I don't mean to say I'm giving up my time. I love this. I would not want to be anywhere else right now than right here, right now, talking to all of you. Um, the CMX organization, Bevy, are donating their time and resources to make it happen as well. 
Ruth and Tiff are giving their time to ensure this whole thing runs smoothly. So you see, it's all about, we're all giving some sort of time donation. All of you are giving your time to listen to what I have to say. And I hope that I'm, I'm making it worth your time. Time is one of the easiest things to, to contribute to a community. That said, it's also the easiest to mismanage. I mean, sure, 30, 60 minutes here, a few times a month, easy, not a problem. But that easily becomes two to three hours a night, every night of the week, where both you and your company's space is being used. So that reference I made to Engine Yard in Buffalo, that's what it became for us. Um, we were like, we want to support every meetup in the, in, the, in the region. We want to do everything we can. It became five nights a week. Uh, we would work in the office. Luckily, I worked remotely, but I would then have to drive into the office so I could be at this meetup because we had a meetup every night of the week for two to three hours, every single night, every day of the month. It became like having a second job. Time is something that can be spread thin quickly and easily. So be mindful of your personal boundaries and your company and organizational boundaries. Don't spread yourself too thin where you're not giving enough valuable time back to the community. Um, the next way to give back is direct collateral. A good example of this is taking the time you've already been giving to create or build something with the community. That could be by hosting an event or giving a talk at an event. Um, it can also mean using your company's space for an event or activity. Direct collateral can often be seen as something that costs you or the company little to nothing, but has a huge benefit for the community. In that example I gave a few minutes ago, using our office space for meetups was easy. We were already paying rent for it. We didn't have to pay more rent because we were doing meetups at night. No one was there that would be bothered or, inter or interrupted. Um, and we had all the necessary equipment like screen, projectors, tables, chairs. All that stuff was already in the office. Um, direct collateral often has a tremendous benefit to the community and creates a massive amount of goodwill. This often leads to creating brand ambassadors or champions who promote your company or product on behalf as a thanks for the donation. And they do that for the community. And the interesting thing about it, too, is right now that's that's more easy than ever. Um, your company probably has a Slack channel or a Mattermost channel um, or they have a Zoom or Jitsi or some sort of video framework. That's what a meetup needs. They need a place to talk and they need a place to interface. If you can donate and say, you know, hey, we'll host your next meetup for you know a couple hours next Thursday, you're giving tremendous value to the community and you're giving back in a way that's costing you basically nothing. Um, of course, there's also money. You can always donate money. You know, communities love money. Everybody loves money. Um, this actually might be more difficult than you think. Some communities are loose organizations with no direct head or like incorporated body to get a payment or cash to. I'm lucky in the fact that I work in open source and there's great organizations like Ruby Together and Tidelift that help to give back to open source projects financially. Um, I hope all of you can hear my dog barking because apparently my mail is being delivered right now. Um, he's not a part of the community. He's a part of a community of bad dogs. Um, part of the growth of the use of direct collateral to give back is based on the idea that communities sometimes neither have nor need a leader. Communities generally self-organize. Um, some will last quite some time while others may be together for a specific event or period of time. These communities are ephemeral, so they may be less value in filtering money to them. It's important as a member and a participant to find out where giving back works and in what form. The more familiar you are with the communities you work with, the more likely you'll be to understand the best ways to give back. That said, especially when it comes to money, do not consider money or sponsorships or, or, or monetary involvement to be a guarantee of membership. Um, you're saying, I'm giving your my time, my space, my collateral, my money for this amount of time. But in the, if you don't directly participate, then you're not really bringing value to the community. So you're not a member, you're a sponsor. You're tangential to what they're trying to do. So while we focus a lot on the value of community and what we do, uh, there's also kind of some important things to remember about being a good citizen. Um, any community is made up of different people with different ideas, different perspectives, different experiences, and different backgrounds. This is essential to the vibrant and value of the community. Although there will be a common bond for all community members, whether it's a programming language, a background in marketing, a focus on logistics, or an inexplicable love of homemade windmills, the way we communicate and the way we converse, the way ideas flow has to incorporate the differences as much as the similarities. Toxicity starts with exclusion. We must, as community members, begin by keeping our eyes open and ready to see how easily exclusion can occur. The idea that something doesn't belong or that someone isn't one of us can happen at the drop of a dime. We need to avoid these things if we want to be good members in our communities. Building and participating communities 
is often about keeping a long memory. We do this not just to remember when it felt new and we had this hello world feeling and we felt welcomed, but also to avoid the potentially toxic situations. Once we know what qualifies as toxic, we can work on building rules and our community can keep people safe and make new folks feel welcome. Um, and there's a variety of toxic situations. Some are more obvious than others, like harassment or abusive behavior. Those are really easy to spot and they can have serious ramifications for the community that last so much longer than the period of the particular incident. Um, that said, there's more insidious toxic behaviors as well that can be less obvious. These include co-opting the community for personal gain, uh, trying to co-opt the community for professional advancement, or even organization can, organizational control over a community. These behaviors need to be avoided at all costs if any community is meant to thrive. And a lot of those behaviors you'll notice, especially organizational control over a community, they happen almost by accident. They're generally done by a large scale company or organization. You as a representative of your company have to be aware uh, when that's being happened, when that's taking place. So little, little hints, little alarm bells that should go off or if they say, hey, you know what? We should start our own meetup. Or hey, you know what? I know that there's a million uh, meetups about this. We should do a conference, but it should really be focused on the people who work here. Um, these are things that will ring alarm bells and will not create goodwill. Sometimes in certain cases, you will eventually not be a member of a community if that's the attitude that you take. Um, avoiding toxic behavior may sometimes seem like common sense, but when we look at the grayer areas, we can see there's like slippery slopes and many people fall right into them. Uh, some ways to avoid setting toxic example would be to always present a positive attitude as a member of the community. Never act as if the community is some sort of burden. And if it starts to feel that way, it might be time to exit. And there might be a greater benefit to sussing out the cause and resolving it. Um, and remember, everyone is coming in with their own perspective and lived experience. Not everyone will agree. To avoid toxicity as an organization, ensure you're working with the community, not just for it. Do not set up events that circle around your product or offer exclusion, you know, anything that would be exclusive to the community. Understand that there will be competitors in the community that you will need to work with and for, um, because that's what makes a great community, not just being the one shining example. Be a member, even as a new organization, not a headliner, not a rock star. So the value of community to an individual, a team, or an entire company or organization cannot be understated. Going it alone is a great way to get started, but at some point you'll need to get a guiding hand to experience some help. Uh, there's no better way to find that help than in a large group of people working to learn and work in the same thought space. There are so many avenues for getting involved online, mostly at the moment, but hopefully we'll get back to meetups and book clubs and conferences and events and all the things that I love to do because God, I just can't stay in my house anymore. Seriously. I need to build a windmill. Um, the key to being part of any community is to be there, be a participant and get involved. Um, I mentioned to Ruth and a couple other folks uh, before we started that I'd been watching this great documentary on Netflix and it's called We Are the Champions. Um, I don't know if it's available in everybody's country, but if you can find it, maybe it's not on Netflix, maybe it's on Amazon. I know these things change depending on locale, but it's a great six episode series. And it takes a look at these competitions and people who are champions in these competitions. And they include things like a cheese rolling contest in England on Cooper's Hill. They include frog jumping competitions, yo-yoing, eating chili peppers, dancing with dogs. It's kind of a bunch of things that you never, you're like, huh, so people compete in these things. Interesting, interesting. But the point of the, the show isn't so much that these people win crazy prizes for doing ridiculous things. That's not the point of the show. The point is that these activities are generated because people have a common interest in them. They have a common belief that what they're doing is fun or, you know, thrilling or exhilarating or whatever it is. They enjoy it. They're working towards a common goal. The common goal is to be the champion. But in a lot of ways, they don't really care if they win. That's the especially with the chili eating contest, because that is dangerous. Um, but like they don't really, the winning is not the point. The point is having community and being a member of that community, feeling like they belong somewhere in, a, in, in some situations where maybe they wouldn't normally. And that's the key. Look at the community as, as, as something you want to be a member of because there's like people who understand you, people who want to be with you, people who want to work towards the same goals as you, not for your benefit, but for everybody's benefit. And that's what being a member is all about. And with that, I'll be happy to take some questions. Thank you very much for listening. Windmills forever. And I'll stop sharing my screen.
Did everybody go to sleep? Is everybody gone? Oh, we're still here. That was great. Thanks. Yeah, I really appreciate some of those um, things that you mentioned. Some really great quotes as well. I was like screenshotting some of the quotes that I found on there before break. Um, okay, I'm just having a quick look in the chat. If anyone has questions, there's a Q&A tab on the chat where you can leave them. So I've got one here. What was the quote about people define the value of a community based on dot, dot, dot? It was about 20 minutes in right after the windmill analogy. <laughs> Oh boy, the windmill analogy. I, I really was thrilled about the whole windmill thing. Um, far too thrilled. So let me see. Uh, doo, 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 doo. Let me see. Wait, how's it? How does it start? Oh no, it's gone. The question is gone. It's been retracted. Oh, let me sorry. see if I can find. What was it. the quote about people define the value of a community based on? Um, I have to look it up because I, to be honest, I got the quotes because I thought they were great quotes. And then I wrote the, the talk, not around the quotes. I think it was um, around when you were talking about the Einstein quote, maybe. Uh, okay. So the idea of working in the needle, let's see. Okay. So I think the idea here is around the idea that people build community based on the values of the things that they want to see. It starts with, with the values that they want to see. So it's kind of that, that old quote of, you know, be the X that you want to see in the world, you know, be the greatness that you want to see in the world. If you want to build a community and you have to build it from scratch, you have to kind of exemplify everything you want that community to be in yourself or in your organization uh, before you can start projecting that upon the world. I think that's really the key is what it's all about. People value communities that they see themselves in. Did everyone get muted there? Somehow. Who knows? Okay. Strange things happening. Did, did any okay. of my answer come through? Okay. <laughs> yes, yes, I think so. Okay. So, yeah, the, the idea is that people want to see themselves reflected in the communities they want to be a part of. Um, and that, that kind of goes into the whole, like, inclusion and diversity thing. Like, if you don't see yourself represented in the community, your chances of joining that community are very slim. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've even seen it in some of the, some of the places that I've worked. I've seen... Uh, women who are unwilling to go to like open source meetups or developer meetups because the meetups were entirely dudes with gray beards uh, with Linux computers and they're, you know, super nerds. And they're like, I don't want to, I don't feel comfortable there and I don't mm -hmm. see myself there and I don't want to be there. So the idea, you know, like communities are people. And if you want, if you want to be re representative people, you want it to have value, it needs to be mm -hmm. inclusive and diverse. I, I was asked that question in a panel at our conference, like, why do I care so much about diversity and why am I making such an emphasis in our community on diversity? I was like, nobody's ever asked me that question <laughs> before. But it's your um, quote that you said about remember what it feels like to get excluded so that you can help build a community where everyone is included. I think that's so important. Like, I'm sure we've all got experiences in our lives of being excluded and we don't necessarily remember that when we're thinking about creating a meetup or like having a um, panel or building a community about, well, is it representative of everyone? Exactly. Not, what can we do about that? Like I've had committees where they're like, but I don't know any people who are not white men. I'm like, well, do something about that. Well, well then I think you really understand the problem, don't you? They're like, I don't know who to invite. I don't know anyone else. And, and you're like, well, yeah, let's start there then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, that's it. That's exactly, that's exactly what it starts with you. If you look around, and you're like, huh, white dudes, white dudes, white dude, white dudes. All right. Yeah. So I'm the problem. I'm the problem. I have to fix it. Mm -hmm. um, like it's the same idea in the community. If it's, it, you know, if you see, if you see yourself represented there, you're going to be like, okay, so I see people who are, you know, drummers who are interested in mid nineties alt rock. I'm going to go to this meetup because that's the kind of stuff that I really, really like, mm -hmm. especially if they wear hats. I'm big on hats, but that's just me. Well, I think also, <laughs> even if it's not representative of the of diverse community, actually just accepting the fact that you know that that's the case mm -hmm. and you're trying as best you can to be open and welcoming. Like my leadership team in our community is all bar one uh, white, white Europeans. Um, but we've been up 
I've been upfront about that. And like, well, these are the people who stepped up. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, that's it. I mean, it's, it's difficult. Diversity is not, uh, diversity and inclusion is not, uh, okay, well we can fix this today. We can, we're done. Mm. We're good. You know, I, the, uh, I actually attended a training by a lady named Kim Creighton, uh, called introduction to anti-racism. And one of the things she talks about is a lot of people will, will come in, take the first 15 minutes of this course. It's a, it, it's, it's an hour and a half. Um, and they'll take the first, first 15 minutes and be like, all right, I'm good. I get it. I'm done. I'm out. Um, and it's like, no, like you, it's a long-term effort. It is a mm -hmm. constant effort to be inclusive, to learn about the importance of other people's perspectives. It's not just something like, you know, like, oh, I did it once. I'm good. I'm, I'm in the clear now. Eddie says, yikes, I'm a drummer with a gray beard if I let it grow. <laughs> yeah, I, I too am a drummer with a gray beard and not by choice. But, you know, I keep the gray beard mostly because the gray hair isn't even growing anymore. So <laughs> also that's why the hats. Um, but yeah, I know, Ruth, you put another question. Thoughts on managing potential and real conflicts of interest when companies are paying their teams to get stuff done in open source. So, yeah, so this is a – I didn't – this is a, a real Pandora's box here because mm -hmm. so there, there's a lot of value in paying someone to get open source done in that 40 hour work week. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to be clear about that. I do not support companies that feel like, like, Oh, we're open source. You should do open source. We'll pay you more to do open source work for us 40 hours a week. And then do we'll, yeah. then go home and do open source. And we'll pay you extra for that. Like even that I'm uncomfortable with. If if the person doing it is like, yeah, that's fine. I'm I'm cool with it because I was going to do it anyway. At least I'm getting money. Sure. You know, as long as you're managing expectations and things like that, that's fine. But for a lot of people who, you know, even a lot of people who just do general community work, they're doing it in their own time, not getting paid for it. Companies really should, you know, offset that. Like say like, oh, you know, oh Ruth and Tiff, you're both doing a meetup tonight. You know what? Take take half a day. Uh, so you have time to get set. <laughs> Well, you're you're new, Tiff. You're not getting anything. Um, <laughs> but no, like I, like a, a lot of places that I've worked, I I, I had a, a balance where a lot of conferences happened on Fridays and Saturdays. So I'd go on Thursday. Um, I wouldn't be expected to do any work on Thursday. Maybe check on emails, things like that. Friday, Saturday, I'm at the conference. Sunday, um, I'm flying home, and then Monday, Tuesday, I take off because I already worked those days. Mm -hmm. um that you know it's just flying people well it's just flying but still work absolutely um, i would agree with you on that one pg i think that the um you know the co companies forget that as well and also from a community management point of view in, in the other types of communities like the support communities if a crisis hits as a community manager you've got to be there to sort it out mm -hmm. and it's it's sometimes quite difficult to get that time back that expectation as community managers that i'm sure we all have that um you will be there 24 7 and you will pick it up when it falls down exactly um, yeah and you know it's like oh there's something happened you know you're you're in the uk something happened in, at, a, at a meetup in japan and the community that you're a part of and a major organizer of well guess what you, you've got to work that and then you, you're still expected to show up at work the next morning yeah absolutely um and that's that's rough that's really rough so yeah, I think there's definitely an ethical standpoint. I, I think the best, as far as like open source goes, the best thing to do is do that kind of offsetting. Um, I was a big fan uh, when I worked at engine yard and a couple other places, we would do what we called freedom Fridays, which means everybody got to work on a passion project or an open source project or something. Didn't have to have anything to do with what, what we were doing mm -hmm. as a company. Didn't have to help with the product at all. It just, you got, you know, after lunch, and if you if you worked in an office, they bought lunch. After lunch, work on whatever you want to for four hours. Before uh, you we get one hour a week of BT. Yeah. One, one hour of personal <laughs> development. <laughs> well, yeah, some companies yeah. also do like initiatives where you can go support the community as well, like go and, you know, help redecorate, uh, you know, children's ward or something like that as well. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's well, another equivalent. Well, yeah. But yeah, I, I think sometimes as well, it's like, unless you actually ask for these things and you say, like, I'd like to do this, but I'm trying to do it outside work, but it actually fits in work. You know, like it actually would make sense for me to do it, say, an afternoon once a month or something. Mm -hmm. Then, like, sometimes it takes someone to ask and take the initiative to say this would be beneficial to me and the to the company for these reasons. Is it all right if I do this or like, yeah. And that, that's, that's really where, where the participation comes in because, I mean, it's it's one thing to say, like, you know, I go to this meetup because I'm into this stuff. 
or I like these things. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's different, you know, cause I've, I've had it go the other way where like I'm into something and the com- the company's like, Hey, actually like we really like this too. Um, and a great example is I'm on the board at uh, OSMI, which is open sourcing mental illness, mm-hmm. um, which is an organization that helps to find speakers specifically in tech that speak on everything from burnout um, and mindfulness to ADHD, to anxiety, depression, bipolar disorder, all of these things that, heavily affect people in the tech industry. We're like the second mm-hmm. or third most heavily hit by mental issues, uh, mental health issues. Um, and that was something that I was into getting these speakers on stage. And so when I started doing it, a lot of the companies I work with were like, Hey, can we actually sponsor that? Like, can we give money and give back to that? Um, or we, you know, Joe in accounting mm-hmm. has depression. Would it be a value if he spoke about that at a meetup? It's like, well, if Joe in accounting wants to, then yes, he definitely should. Yeah. Um, but like that's you know that's a lot of times you know you you bring your personal interests. I don't care what anybody says. You bring your personal interests to work with you, whether that's you think pretty. you do or you don't. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you know it's it's all up to the organizations about whether they want to make you make make your participation, your membership, uh, something of value to them. And yeah. they should. I mean, there's almost never a negative to it. I think also sometimes um, the sea level folk do not understand the amount of open source or like other projects and communities that their business is built on. And sometimes yep. it literally takes like, here's a spreadsheet that shows every single piece of software code or like community that it provides input into our business. And here's how much we're contributing to them. And here's how much we make as a result of using their software. Mm-hmm. How about we address this and maybe <laughs> donate hundred dollars a month to each of these companies exactly yeah you know like it would make no difference to your bottom line but a huge difference to those contributors and like they're just like sometimes people who are not necessarily in the weeds in tech or in any project don't necessarily appreciate the outside influences that help them do what they do in the world now so or like could be valuable to people and help them do what they do like your um, osmi example Mm -hmm. you know and so like by raising awareness of that and saying hey we could actually become a contributor and do something active rather than just taking stuff people just don't realize you know yeah i I think i i think with especially in tech it depends at the c level it really depends on if the c level is a founder creator if if it's someone who you know like it matter most our two our two founders are the CEO and the CTO they get open source even though oddly enough they both came from Microsoft part of the reason why they left Microsoft is because they wanted to work in open source um, granted this is years ago before Microsoft was a big open source company um, but they were like we want to build a, a game and we want to do this and we want to use open source software to do it and so like everybody was like that's really cool go go do your thing. Um, they understand the value of open source at matter most, which is great. Other companies less so. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I've, I've worked at companies where like the CEO is for lack of a better term, a professional CEO. Like there's people that do that for a living. Like they're just CEOs for a living. I don't, I don't get it. I wouldn't want that job. Um, I'd, I'd love the paycheck, but, um, but we all. yeah, to, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But like they, they they don't, they don't see the value in things cause they've never sat down at a terminal and, 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 compiled code they've never you know pushed something to a, a git repo and and seen like you know the world use their software they just know how to run a company and those values often clash with what the community wants or what the community needs um so it's key to like as you know as, as being being your being the member that's coming in is like you said make the spreadsheet point it out to them be like hey you know we we use ruby on rails and and that's free. We that's one hundred percent free. We could build a website in moments. Uh, maybe it'd be cool if we donated something to Ruby together, since they pay all the Rails contributors and the Ruby contributors and the Bundler contributors and all the tools that we use. I'm sure we can afford two hundred bucks a month. We're making ten million dollars every month. Um, you know, and it, it like a lot. Sometimes if you just do it, like it makes us look really good. If we just donate a little bit of time and cash, um, so it's not. It's often not that difficult to convince them, but they definitely come in with blinders on, not knowing what to do. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Did we have all the questions covered off there, PJ? I think so. Yeah, I think so. Wendy says yes. That... <laughs> I'm thumbs up in that one. Okay. 
Um, so what we usually do now is to hop into um, smaller breakout rooms. Let me just. Um, and I usually have some kind of fun thing to, for us to talk about, like a bit of an icebreaker. Um, so this month's challenge is your favourite festive decoration. So it <laughs> might be Diwali, but it might be Christmas, it might be some other festival. But yeah, like name, company, what you do and your favourite festive decoration and then just see where conversation takes you so I'm going to put us into two rooms because there's seven of us so I figured that might be a good option and um, if there's any problems like if you're in a room and nobody's chatting then do feel free to um, come back and join the other room or come back into the main room so let's see if the technology works did it work still yeah it works if the three of us are in the same room. Yeah. There was no, it's just, I, don't, I don't know. So I think we can join the room. So if you have a look on the rooms tab, you can click one and join oh, one. So oh, we, there we go. One, maybe one of you go into room one and room two and I'll stay here. I'll head to room two then. Okay. <laughs> 